Hello and welcome to our webinar, The Cost Saving Benefits of Telematics for University Fleet Operators. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, if you have any questions at any time during the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat area and we'll go through them at the end. And without further ado, I'll hand you over to Sean Mayer, Global Sales Director for Cortex Vehicle Tracking. Yeah, hi, good morning all and good afternoon all, depending on where you are. Uh, for our US friends, good morning, and our UK friends, good afternoon. And welcome to the webinar, and thank you, Christian, for the introduction. And uh, yeah, my name's Sean Mark, Global Sales Director for Cortex. I've been with the company for 15 years, and um, really today is for me to just run through a bit about what we do, how we do it, and more importantly, to introduce you to Chris Lane, the Fleet Manager at the University of Birmingham. So without further ado, um, if I just run through and uh, give you some explanation as to who Cortex are and what we operate. So first things first, we know a lot of our customers face challenges, in fact, all of our customers, and we feel that all customers before Cortex are looking to go down a journey, and that journey is looking to give them visibility so that people are able to see very quickly and very easily where their vehicles are, where their mobile work, when their mobile workers leave head office, there really is no visibility unless, unless you're operating a tracking system. We also understand that this can lead to waste, so poor adherence to work plans, less effective job allocation, the next headache is misuse and fraud. So people could be using the vehicles for their own personal use outside of normal hours. There could be potentially fuel theft and even cargo theft. So the idea of the tracking uh, system helps our customers understand where the vehicles are, how they've got there, and ensuring that, as I say, there's no misuse of the vehicles uh, and ensuring that any mileage done outside of normal hours is, is charged accordingly. There's also capacity. You want to make sure that your vehicles aren't inefficient. The most important part of all of any journey is making sure that when the vehicles are out and the drivers are out there doing their job, they're as efficient and effective as possible, and vehicle tracking gives you that utilization. There's road risk, and we can look at uh, companies having their duty of care, just making sure that vehicles are out there driving safely, where there's lone workers, ensuring that those, those workers are in the right place at the right time, and that they're safe and they're getting home every night. And the final point is environment. If vehicles are being driven around um, and they're using more road miles than they need to, there's a carbon there's a carbon footprint and emissions going into the climate, and that is a massive impact on not only the business but also the, the, the world as a whole. So really helping ensure, ensure that customers are understanding the environmental issues around their vehicle fleet. So are we? Cortex, we've been established for over 21 years. We've got over 23,000 fleet customers. All of our technology is built in the UK. We're financially exceptionally strong with a market capitalization of 200 million pounds and we sit on the London Stock Exchange. And importantly, we're still majority owned by our original founders, which is pretty unique in our environment. So why us? We operate direct flexible rental agreements with no auto renewal clauses. We have reliability. Um, we have an easy to use system with ex ex exceptional after sales support, which is vital to all of our customers. You want to ensure that if you're buying a product that in the event that there's a problem, it can be dealt with quickly and efficiently and effectively. Lifelong, lifelong, lifetime warranty on and all on, and, and free product updates all the way through your journey with us. I think giving you a lifetime warranty kind of gives you the reassurance of knowing that we're confident that our product is stable because giving a life, lifetime warranty means that we're putting our money where our mouth is and backing our own product. We have a proven track record, as I say, over 21 years experience in this market. Um, with over 250,000 units currently active across across our network. We have a vehicle inspection app, we have dash cams, we have driving behavior, all reasons uh, helping our customers understand where their fleet is and helping their, their, their actual employees use the system to their advantage as well. The experience, really important, as I said at the beginning, we've built our reputation over the last 22 years on our service. That's given us a 4.8 um, score on Trustpilot, and also for us, really, really proud of the fact that we've been given gold for investors and customers again. This shows that we have our customers at heart in all of what we do. Our, our ethos is we have a customer facing lens to ensure that our customers are getting the best service from us all of the time. The cost benefit. We see customers reporting 10% fuel reduction. We see an, an, an overall um, workforce productivity increased by 15%. We see reduced overtime claims. We see 15% more vehicle to utilization, fewer miles driven. So again, cutting down on fuel and that carbon footprint and also reduction in idle times, vehicles parked up with engines running. This again is a cost directly to the business. It's costing you fuel and it's costing you operative hours as well. So the system can give you all of those at the touch of a button. And now finally, I'd like to introduce Chris Lane. Um, University of Birmingham have operated with Cortex since 2017. 
and we track around 100 vehicles for them. Now, Chris is a well-respected and well-known face in the fleet sector, and Chris holds many accolades, which include being enrolled into the top 100 most influential managers in 2020. He was actually a head of Ford Motor Company's head of fleet, which I think is a great result. And Chris has been recognised as the best fleet manager by Fleet World, Green Fleet, and Great British Fleet, and also best fleet of the year, again, awarded by Green Fleet. So without further ado, Chris, it's over to you. Okay, firstly, my apologies. Um, I was due to be in the office today and unexpectedly got called away. Um, that's the reason that uh, you may get some difficulties in the, uh, the feed coming through. I've had to turn the camera off to make the best of the uh, voice, so my apologies for that. Um, as Sean said, I'm representing the University of Birmingham, basically our transport department. Um, I actually run PPT services, which involves post portraying and transport for the university. Um, conscious there are some people that may not be from the UK, so just wanted to explain exactly where we are. Um, circled in the middle of the country there is Birmingham, and approximately two hours away um, to the south is London, so you know just where that is. And there's a big black arrow on the left-hand side there. If you remember where that is, that is Devon and Cornwall, and we'll come to that a little bit later. Um, Here's a Google shot of Birmingham city centre. You'll see there's a yellow line running all the way around it, which is a ring road. Again, remember that and we'll mention that later. And the actual university is approximately two and a half miles outside the city centre. Okay, lovely place to work. Um, it's a beautiful campus. And part of what you will see on the presentation slides on the right hand side, is actually a clock tower. Birmingham University has got the highest or the tallest freestanding clock tower in the world. That's the reason for that display there. Okay, I'd like to talk a little bit about our sustainable logistics journey, where we came from, um, some of the successes we had around 2020, 2022, some of the challenges, some of the examples of how we've used uh, technology and what we're doing moving forward. Um, hopefully explain everything on the way. So we were quite a forward thinking university. Back in 2007, we had our first electric vehicle. Um, quickly moving on as more and more vehicles came on track, um, different models such as Nissan and Kango, which were much better vehicles, uh, we started to increase the percentage of the fleet. Back in 2015, um, my boss set a target of achieving 40% of the fleet to be alternatively fueled within five years. So she wanted to get that done by 2020. I'd like to add that I didn't join the university until 2017. So we were well on our way by then, but we had the hard yard still to complete. But we did actually achieve that 40% in 2019, which was a whole year earlier than we said. I'd like to talk a little bit about our core fleet now. What we actually have, if we look back at April 2020, we had 114 vehicles. By now we're up to 44% alternatively fueled and our CO2 was just over 11 tonnes. July 2021, we still had 114 vehicles but have progressed now to 51% alternatively fueled. So we were obviously swapping out the uh, diesel and petrol engine vehicles and bringing in electric vehicles, again, reducing our CO2 down to just over 10 tonnes. We then took a big step in January 2022, looked at the fleet again. We'd now reduced our vehicles down to 99, but we were still at over 50% alternatively fueled. So we'd come down to just over nine tonnes now of CO2. So that was actually an, a decrease of 18% in less than two years. And remember, we were starting from already being at that 40%. So it really was a big step. And it's something that certainly we like to shout about. Let's talk a little bit now about how we did that. That's our fleet journey as it is, but dovetailing back into um, what we're here to talk about today. What we started to do was to say, okay, we need to set principles. So we now as a business took the decision to say, 
if you want to replace a vehicle, yeah, it must be electric, unless you can give us a business case that there isn't, it can't be used as electric. The second thing we did to try and get people used to electric vehicles is we actually have a pool vehicle, which is electric. So each time one of their vehicles goes for service or a check or has to have a puncture, the vehicle that we lend them is electric and all of a sudden they're getting used to it and they like it. Second bit, which was a huge piece of work, which we actually looked at individual departments and by using the telematics data that uh, Cortex provide for us, we can actually identify when vehicles aren't being used. Um, we really need to understand, you know, rather than each person having their own vehicle and saying, okay, this is my vehicle, I'm driving from point A to point B, and you find that the second person is also driving point A to point B, we managed to reduce those numbers. We went a little bit further, we make sure that people are sharing vehicles, we encourage them to move away, as I say, from one person to one vehicle, and not only just within departments, but we get separate departments to look at sharing vehicles. My own department in postal services actually co-shares a vehicle with our car parking services, again, reducing our fleet by a whole vehicle that way. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, this is the actual hardware that is installed by Cortex. It's a little black box that's fitted into the vehicle that you don't know it's there, and that gives you all the data for that vehicle. If you then want to go a step further, um, which is something we're about to do, you can actually get that data down to driver level, which means on the right hand side, you see those red little disks there. Those are actually driver fobs and they're individual to each driver. So you can drill down information purely down to that particular driver. This is something that uh, I like to bring to people's attention. The fact that we have reduced our CO2 that we're putting out, but it's getting harder we're replacing vehicles and the older vehicles are actually rated as less than the new ones. Specifically, the one to look at is the bottom one because that is a like-for-like -like vehicle. The vehicle was registered in July 2020 and all the documents tell us that it's 180 grams per kilometre. The new vehicle that's being issued is now 248 grams per kilometre. My personal feeling that the manufacturers are trying to protect themselves from any further claims, but it certainly makes our hard, our job much harder trying to keep that CO2 down. Now, I'd like to talk about some of the examples that we've used telematics for. Um, these aren't made up, these are specific things that we have used the system. On campus, we have a speed limit of 15 miles an hour. And we do get people contacting us saying, I've just seen a speeding vehicle. Before we had any data, we couldn't prove it either way. But now, both ways, we can protect the driver and say, yes or no, he was speeding, and go from there. Exactly the same again, our postal services team have to be at certain places to collect and deliver. And like with most logistics, we get people that have missed their cutoff time. The driver's already been to collect and they come and they complain and say your person came and collected too late or they haven't been at all. Before the data, again, no defence. Now we can just prove it categorically without a problem. My team uh, in transport have to locate the vehicles across campus. That's just a screenshot of what the um, mapping shows when you want to look for a vehicle, tells you exactly where it is. That's actually sat outside my office. Uh, saves them heaps of time trailing across the campus trying to locate vehicles. The second one is we actually had an employee that was working just off campus uh, with a Toyota Hilux that he got out of the vehicle, went and did some other things, left the vehicle running with the keys in, and lo and behold, somebody started to take that vehicle. Telematics meant we got that vehicle back in an hour and a half. If we hadn't had that fitted, you know, we had no insurance claim, the keys were still in the vehicle, the insurance company wouldn't have paid out on us. So we'd have probably lost 30 to 40,000 pounds worth of vehicle. 
Remember I uh, asked you to remember where that black arrow was pointing to in the map? That was actually pointing to Devon and Cornwall, which is approximately four to five hours drive from Birmingham. This is a notice of intended prosecution saying our vehicle's involved in a road traffic accident and we failed to stop. The telematic system that we have, we could prove that that vehicle was four to five hours away from where they said it was. So obviously either they'd recorded the registration incorrectly or someone had cloned that registration. Again, without that, we'd have had a real battle trying to prove that. Again, I, I said, remember the yellow circle around Birmingham? That's the outer ring road. And within that is what we call a clean air zone. So only certain vehicles are permitted to go in that zone as they are less polluting vehicles, older vehicles. If you enter that zone, you have to pay a daily charge. The daily charge for Birmingham is currently eight pounds. And if you fail to pay, I think the current fine is 60 pounds. So we can actually ring fence or geofence that area and we get a warning comes through from Cortex that says your vehicle has gone into that area and we can double check and you know pay the daily charge, thus avoiding the fine. Um, doesn't really need to look too closely at this, but the green line is showing the status of a battery in a vehicle. Uh, the yellow and red line, if you can see them, is where it should be at 12 volts. We had an issue with a vehicle and twice my team took it into the dealership and twice the dealership said, no, the battery's taking charge, it's fine. The third time they took it in, we took this with it, which shows the battery's not holding its charge. And they said, yes, sir, thank you very much. We'll change your battery. Um, we now make sure that if we have an issue with a battery, we take it in with us on the first call, not the third. This one I think is probably the most important one that we had. Um, that's our vehicle uh, involved in a head-on accident on a fairly tight country lane. What we were able to do was once we were aware that the vehicle had been involved in an accident, then we contacted uh, Cortex to give us some more data. They actually produce a track of showing where that vehicle is prior to the accident and those dots are spaced at one second intervals. They can then further drill down into, I believe it's one tenth of a second to tell us where that vehicle is. It's really good that that data is there and you can then interpret it. However, the biggest thing they gave us was this graph. Don't worry too much about all the, the different lines on the graph, but if you concentrate where that arrow is, that's actually showing us that our vehicle at point of impact was stationary. So again, we can prove that our vehicle had stopped. It wasn't at fault. The third party's vehicle was the one that hit us. And we went back to the third party and said, thank you very much, you can pay. What we're doing moving forward, we know that not all vehicles can be replaced with electric vehicles at the moment. For instance, our security department they operate 24 seven, the vehicles don't stop. So at the moment, there isn't the capacity to charge them. I think that will probably change soon. So what we do is say, okay, let's look for the best next solution. Let's give them a hybrid vehicle. So again, we're trying to pull that CO2 footprint down as much as possible. What we're doing next, education is a big thing. Um, yeah, after all, we are a university. As I mentioned, at start we're looking to now bring through uh, and introduce the fact that we're going to be looking at driver level telematics so we can look and we can report back to that driver how they're driving is it nice and smooth if someone's driving smoother it's less pollution coming from the vehicle and less wear and tear on it and we will continue looking at our vehicle utilization and the big one that we're looking at now is vehicle idling times especially coming off the back of winter when people were looking and just sat there in the vehicle with the engine running to keep warm. Suffice to say for us, the future looks bright. I think we're on the right track. I think we've got the right things in place and things are looking bright. And the one thing to remember is that's the reason we do it. So thank you.
Thank you, Chris. Uh, really appreciate that. And, uh, obviously, uh, some really good, interesting insights from there as well. I guess that just opens the door to uh, any questions that have arisen over the last uh, 15, 20 minutes from uh, the information I've given and more importantly, Chris, on actually using the system. Um, there's just a question if really quickly, Sean, if you're able to just uh, give us a brief kind of overview of the kind of reports that um, Chris and any other people will be able to use when looking at driving style um, for both yeah. the US and the UK. Yeah, of course. So, I mean, basically what Chris has explained there is that the system itself has got the ability to be able to show driving performance, driving behavior. So we provide you, first of all, with a league table that very simply would show who's your best and who's your worst uh, vehicle or driver. And we look at risk. So risk is very simple. We look at we look at the, the, the kind of speed that's being done. We look at the acceleration. We look at the braking. And typically, if you've got a person that is constantly heavy braking and heavy accelerating, then the typical thing will be that their score will be far Will be will be far lower than somebody that's driving at a, at a at a sensible manner. And as Chris mentioned earlier on, you want that smooth flow. Um, and from there, we can identify then based on algorithms where the risk sits. Are they red? Are they amber? Are they green? Typically, you want customers to be operating with all of their drivers in the green as opposed to red. Statistically, if your drivers are operating in the green, they are 20 times more likely to be less likely to be involved in an at fault accident. So going back to Chris's point. I would suggest that the crash he showed us where the vehicle was stationary. I would also pretty, be pretty sure that that driver had a, had a green score on the day um, because they were driving sensibly. They could see the danger that was coming. They stopped and there was nothing more they could do apart from deal with the incident after it had happened. So we're able to say very, very simply that here is your high risk element. Here's your mid risk and here's your low risk. And if you can start bringing people out of that red into the amber and then finally into the green, what you will also see is le obviously less risk, but also less cost, because if they're driving at a, a smoother rate, then you're going to be using less fuel. Less fuel consumption, again, is obviously a good thing for everybody. And importantly, everybody's getting home safe at night. There are options as well um, within the speed data to be able to pull um, excessive speed reporting. So, uh, so, for example, if you wanted to look at people in the US on a freeway, we can identify vehicles that are driving above a certain speed. You can ask for vehicles that are operating outside of a certain speed zone, and we can identify them for you. Again, in the UK, we can look at uh, we can we can do exactly the same scenario. So uh, the idea here is that it's all about ease of use and, and, and the quickness to be able to identify and understand where the issues are. We go one step further with our mobile app in that if you have a driver that wants to be more engaged in the product, they can actually review their own driving score on the app when it's safe to do so, obviously. Um, so during the working day, they can be reviewing their own scores. And if they're having a pretty bad day, they've got the ability to make changes to their score to bring that score up so they become green by the end of it. But it's, it's empowering that driver to be able to understand what they're doing and how it affects them, how it affects you as a business, and importantly, how it affects the general public. Because somebody driving dangerously is a risk to themselves, to the general public, and of course, to you as a business. So that's kind of what we do with driving behavior. But it's very simple and easy to understand. And if anybody on here wants more information, we can gladly send you a pack just explaining that and showing you some of the samples. But it's a league table, red, amber, green. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Thank you so much, Sean, for being with us today. And thank you for coming and uh, joining the webinar. If you have any more questions, you can please um, send an email to sean.mayor at cortex.net. Thank you very much, you. and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.